Welcome everyone to the screening of the story of plastic, uh, which illustrates in great deal, detail the impact big plastic has on communities, individuals, and the natural environment through the life of plastic, from extraction to disposal. And I will let the movie speak for itself. Uh, my name is Mindy O'Brien. I'm the coordinator of Voice Ireland. And with Friends of the Earth, uh, we founded the Sick of Plastic campaign back in Ireland in 2018, and are members of the Break Free from Plastic movement. But before I go any further, I'd like to go through some housekeeping. First of all, we'll be sharing a few polls with you during the tonight's panel discussion, and you've already done the first one. We'll do another one um, uh, at the end of my introduction. And also, if you have any questions for the panelists, please type them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Also, we would love to hear more about you, uh, so please share your name and location and what you're passionate about in the chat box so you can say hello to other people listening in tonight. You might have some friends who are listening in as well. Now, back to the movie. I want to congratulate the story of Stuff, uh, an organization who made this insightful movie, and the Break Free from Plastic Movement, who has been pushing for the, the fast-moving consumer goods companies to change their practices, and policymakers to adopt ambitious legislation to turn off the tap on plastic. They've also highlighted the link between petrochemical companies and plastic, their power, and how to combat them. We have been working hard in Ireland to achieve effective national legislation to reduce single-use plastic, adapt a deposit refund scheme for drinks containers, facilitate and promote reuse solutions, and to push forward the circular economy as a new business and societal model. And we ask you to join us in our efforts and to sign up to our Sick of Plastic campaign and to either join an existing Sick of Plastic group or start your own Unchange X. Now, enough of me, and I would like to introduce, introduce our moderator tonight uh, is Avine McCann, who has kindly offered help us this evening. Thank you, Avine. She is a theater, film, and television actor with roles in hit shows such as Vikings and Cat Cope Won't Cope. She recently won an Irish Times Theater Awards for Best Actress in the Lyric Theater production, A Streetcar Named Desire. She's also a sustainability activist and campaigner with a particular interest in environment of impacts of fast fashion. And we are thrilled that she is here with us today. So thank you, Avine, and it's over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, everybody. So just to bear in mind, it's still technology we're dealing with this evening. So if things go wrong, bear with us. They're very unlikely, it's very unlikely to happen that way, but we'll try our very best. Um, I don't want to spend too much time uh, talking. So I'm going to introduce the panelists just now. It's We've got, uh, if you want to wave everyone as I say your name, <laughs> we've got Andy Giorgio, Fracking Policy Advisor, Food and Water Europe. We've got Dr. Niall O'Leary, School of Microbiology, UCC. Dr. Anna Watson, Head of Adv Advocacy at Chem Trust, excuse me. And we have Megan Carmody, Head of Movement Building, Friends of the Earth. And we have Sorka Kavanagh, coordinator of Conscious Cup campaign, and of course, Angela Kenny from Sick of Plastic. Um, we're gonna begin some introductions, much more uh, comprehensive ones from each person. So first of all, Andy, fire ahead and tell us, tell us what you're about. That's very <laughs> cash <laughs> me. Go ahead, Andy, show us what you're about. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me and for giving me the chance to, to give this presentation here. Um, I, I bumped in, into the work on plastics through the work on fracking, uh, which is also a key issue in, in, in Ireland. Um, and um, I did that by supporting the anti-fracking movement in the UK. Uh, and I know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, where we have um, one main company that, that owns a majority of the shale licenses in England and Scotland. And it's a petrochemical company named Ineos. Um, it's um, the largest virgin plastic producer in, in the UK and also in Europe. And I was intrigued to learn that um, they've jumped in, into the business of fracking um, in order to secure um, cheap raw material supply for their um, plastics business. And this is when I've started, um, you know, digging deeper and, and Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Europe have published three issue briefs. And, and this is um, when I've also started to reach out to the Break Free from Plastic movement in order to work with them. Um, do you want me to, to start with the slides right now or? Okay, so I've prepared a few slides to give you an overview because we were asked to um, 
to kind of like explain a bit the role that we're having within the Break from Plastic movement. Um, as I've already mentioned, I, I came in as an outsider um, and I'm working now with BFFP for over two years, I would say, two and a half years. Um, and it was important to, to kind of like realize that we will not be able to tackle the plastic crisis um, without tackling the upstream part of the plastic production. And this upstream part is directly linked um, to the fracking industry in the United States. And it's also directly linked um, to the other major overarching crisis, which is the climate crisis. And one key player that I've already mentioned is INEOS. Um, but before I, I go a bit deeper into what INEOS is doing, I just want to highlight that petrochemicals um, as such are about to rapidly become the largest driver of global oil. And this includes the so-called wet gas or ethane consumption ahead of trucks, aviation and shipping. This is according to a report by the International um, Energy Agency called the Future of Petrochemicals. Um, and this sector alone is already the largest industrial consumer of fossil fuels accounting as of 2018 <laughs> for 14% of global oil and 8% of gas primary demand. Um, and it's important to, to, to raise awareness about this because th the whole developments within the petrochemical um, industry, including the plastic industry, is not really part of the climate debate. And, and we need to make it part of the climate debate because it's completely under the radar, but it has a major role in it. So the EIA expected in late 2018 that the cheap frac gas, which is ethane consumption, uh, will grow by 70% until 2030. And that's in part due to the expansion of US exports to Europe. I, I say expected because due to COVID-19, we don't really know how, how this will unfold within the next few months, but this is kind of like the scenario that we're in. And I also want to refer to a very important report uh, published by CL last year. Um, where for the first time they've tried to assess the full life cycle um, impact of plastic production starting from the extraction of fossil fuels. And according to their numbers, uh, which are pretty conservative, um, the, the full life cycle emissions of, of plastic production um, could generate 56 gigatons of CO2 emissions uh, by 2050. And this is as much as 10 to 13% of our entire remaining carbon budget for a 1.5 global warming scenario. So again, these two major crises, plastic pollution, <laughs> climate crisis, they're directly linked to one another. And it's important to raise this issue and also to bring uh, these two movements together, the anti-fracking and anti-gas and also the anti-plastic movement. Um, I want now to, to just um, show you what INEOS is in actual fact doing. By 2016, they've started um, establishing a transatlantic supply chain of frac gas that is coming from Pennsylvania. Um, and they've commissioned um, eight ships that are now on a regular basis um, transporting frac gas from the United States, um, either from, from Pennsylvania, which is here, the Marcus Hook facility, or if, if they're not able to transport it from here, from Houston, which is the largest petrochemical cluster in the world, to their um, plastic facilities at Grangemouth in Scotland or uh, Roughness in Norway. Um, and they have um, plans to expand this and to invest into new facilities based on frac gas from the US at Antwerp and Belgium. And they also have plans to use Antwerp as a hub um, for storage hub for frac gas, and they've commissioned um, extra ships that will then tr further transport the hydrocarbons from Antwerp to the other petrochemical facilities at Cologne. Um, and what this actually means, this, this fracking for, for plastics business of INEOS, um, this we only realize when we look into how the construction of a pipeline that INEOS needs to really get the, the frac gas from the fracking fields to the export terminal at Marcus Hook. When we look into what happened and what happens during the construction of this pipeline. Sunoco is, is the main uh, partner of INEOS. 
and they've been fined in 2018 12.6 million uh, dollars. Um, this is one of the largest fines uh, ever ordered in, in the US um, by the Department of the Environment in Pennsylvania because of ongoing violations. Sorry, Andy, 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay, because of ongoing violations um, during the construction. Um, and, I, and now I have to rush a bit through my slide because I'm realized I don't have enough time. Uh, INEOS has plans to, to frack in, in um, the US as well. Um, one interesting uh, part that is directly linked to um, Ireland and also the anti-LNG campaign is that New Fortress Energy, who owns um, the Shannon LNG project, um, has now teamed up with INEOS. Um, and INEOS is now in actual fact um, supplying the, the floating storage unit of New Fortress Energy in Jamaica with frac gas from the United States. Um, so this, this is something that is really important for the Irish um, anti-fracking, anti-LNG, but also anti-plastic movement to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Sorry to rush you there. <laughs> no, no worries. I promise. Um, and now we have Dr. Niall O'Leary up next to impart his wisdom. And thank you again, as Andy said, thanks very much for the invitation and the opportunity to contribute. I hope you can hear me. You can... Yeah, okay, great. Um, and I'm going to, um, I suppose, briefly just introduce myself for why I'm interested in this or involved in this area. Um, as a microbiologist rather than a chemist, I suppose, what's the relevance? Uh, my PhD work uh, many years ago, I won't say how many, focused on styrene degradation and the ability of bacteria to do that kind of thing. And, and bacteria are our natural cleaners of the planet and fungi, if you like, and are seen as a, as a biotechnological opportunity maybe to get involved uh, in plastic polymer cleanup. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, as I go on. So from there, I moved into areas of wastewater and um, away from uh, pollutant degradation into the ability of bacteria to actually store polymers within their cells. And some of those polymers behave very much like plastics that we have, but because they're produced by natural systems, they can be uh, degraded. In natural environments. So the video talked a little bit about biopolymers and I'm going to comment on that to try and provide uh, maybe a bit more balanced arguments uh, in relation to that, that topic as well. So given the time is tight I'm just going to jump into the slides here straight away and try and share my screen with you. So I'll start at the other end maybe. Okay, hopefully you can see the first slide there by Patrick Campbell. Great, okay, thank you. So just some of the challenges and myths, I suppose, the, the, the case has been very, made very clearly, I suppose, about plastic um, accumulation in the environment in the video. And the, this slide just shows the kind of, you know, how different types of plastics that dominate our, our current uh, consumption when they emerged. And this line indicates their rapid growth and that is continuing now. But in the background, scientists have been observing, I suppose, or it's been science's role to observe the impacts of this. And um, so we've gone from invention and development, which continues on now um, into product diversification and then starting to see the accumulation in natural habitats. So what I just wanted to summarize for some people maybe was the kind of key points and where we are or where the research community is now looking in relation to plastics and the microplastics and nanoplastics scale. And it brought up a point in the video about visibility. Um, the, one of the commentators talked about it, how, how visible it was now, but actually our concern is that we're moving away from visibility to invisibility again. So plastic use and accumulation and the impacts on wildlife in the 1960s began to be seen, I suppose, in island um, environments with um, uh, bird species that were being affected and were feeding on different materials and altering um, their survival patterns. And then plastic debris showing up in the 70s. Actually, as this moved on, some legislation started to emerge, but the research community seemed to lose focus in this area in the 1990s until the garbage patches began to appear or be commentated on um, in the 2000s. And since then, we've moved on very quickly into categorizing where plastics are. These are two seminal reports by the GASAMP uh, group, this group of experts on the scientific aspects of marine environmental protection. And these two reports essentially went down and documented marine environments, the creatures living in them, and the prevalence of microplastics among them. And it's quite stark reading just how widespread uh, these materials are in our environment. 
and in the fauna in them. What we're beginning to see now in microplastics is their accumulation uh, and trophic transfer up through food webs and there was comments on this in the um, documentary. And this is a serious problem because it's, you know, some of these creatures form the real basis of the food web um, and make their way to us also. Greenhouse gas emissions have begun to emerge airborne microplastics, but this area is probably of most concern at the moment. And I know Anna Watson may comment on this in relation to health, so I don't want to say too much, but nanoplastics, we begin to lose visibility of plastics when they get to this scale because it requires really complex chemistry to be able to monitor them and track them. And they really are invisible. And nanomaterials behave differently to the large macro scale material. They take on different chemical reactivity. And these are small enough to interact with the bacteria in your gut even. And there are a lot of studies coming out showing at this level um, across a range of organisms that what is the normal role of your bacteria in your gut, and I suppose I'm just taking a microbi microbiology focus, others may take a different focus, that those bacteria secrete metabolites that control a lot of things in your body. And when you introduce pollutants, you can change the chemical signaling and start to move towards um, poor health outcomes. The problem is we're in a kind of a black box in relation to this and really playing catch up in relation to the health impacts. But I don't imagine the picture is going to improve any from what was presented in the um, documentary in relation to this. The other side from a researcher's point of view is where does money come in for research? And if you look at European funding over the last number of years, so uh, for anybody not involved when, in research, if you want to secure funding, there are normally uh, tranches of money that are put aside by Europe. Um, and these were called the framework programs. So there are large volumes of, of money, huge sums now uh, in the billions, and you would go in with partners to try and uh, get access to these funds. So what this table just shows is the amount of money that was given over to, giving, to producing new plastics. So these large blue sections here are new plastics being made, okay? And then this is money in grey being spent on investigating biodegradation. So very small amounts of the funding pot were given to this, but they began uh, to increase slightly. BioClean was a project that was given three million to try and find a biotechnological solution to plastic. And what that was, was 18 partners across a range of European countries and one Chinese collaborator who targeted the common plastics of our day and they took bacteria from every environment they could, potentially a huge collection of microbes, fungi, et cetera. They screened them for their ability to interact with these polymers and degrade them. And out of all those um, hundreds of thousands, they got down to 65, which really had a limited capacity to have any impact on these materials. And those were under ideal conditions. So the point I suppose I'm trying to make is that these materials are not going to degrade um, in our environment anytime soon and also the capacity for biotechnology to produce enzymes and systems to degrade these, even though Europe is pushing money in this direction, really is a long game. So it's, it's uh, anyone waiting for a, a sort of short-term biotechnological solution is going to be waiting quite some time in relation to degradation. The other point made in the movie was about biopolymers um, and the idea that we're almost ready to go in relation to delivering these. Uh, there's a caveat emptor here, though, in that many of the bio, the classified as bioplastics, um, these fall into this category here, which are biodegradable, but they are, um, sorry, these are biodegradable ones here, I apologize. These are bio-based, uh, but non-biodegradable. So the argument being made in the study about um, bio-PET coming from corn, but being just as polluting, that's what's reflected uh, largely in the industry at present. Uh, sorry, but, no, that's seven minutes. Oh, sorry. So it's my last point, actually. So the bioplastics industry, to be fair, only occupies 1% of the global market and is not ready if the plastics industry turned around tomorrow and said, okay, we'll switch over to biopolymers. We are not ready to do that in any meaningful shape. So there's going to be a lag and really the responsibility falls back to consumers to perform the most immediate um, intervention in this issue. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry for rushing you there. No, no, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on now to Dr. Anna Watson. Thanks, Anna. Oh, sorry, I have to stop sharing. Apologies. And Anna, you're muted at the moment. Okay, that's lovely. Hi. Hello, everybody. It's great to be part of this panel this evening. Um, so I am just going to start sharing my screen 
as well. Again, let's hope that everything goes um, smoothly with this. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I am just going to give you a brief overview um, on the issue of plastics, chemicals and health. Um, I work for a small NGO, um, we're called ChemTrust. Um, we are a charity and we work at the UK, the EU and the global level to protect humans and wildlife from harmful chemicals. Um, we're based in the UK, also in Denmark and Germany and Brussels. And we work with scientists and decision makers um, on this issue of hazardous chemicals and we work very closely with other civil society groups and one of those Civil society movements is a break free from plastic movement, um, which were the people behind the film that you have all watched. Um, this is going to be quite a fast overview of some of the issues to do with um, plastics and health, but you can find out more information um, about many of the things that I'm going to touch on on our website. Um, so chemicals, they're not only the main ingredients of plastics, they're also um, the additives that go in. So if you look at that, the picture here, um, that water bottle, it's got colour, so chemicals are used to um, colour the, that water bottle, they're added, chemicals are added to plastics to make them soft, they're added to make them less flammable. So you know, you'll be joining this this evening on your phone or your laptop or desktop, um, that's got chemicals to stop um, you know, obviously those things sort of, you know, be, being more resistant to um, fire. Um, the other aspect about um, chemicals and plastics is there are impurities. So the chemical impurities get into plastics through the manufacture and also through the degradation. And some of those substances have not yet been identified. And because they're not identified, we therefore have no data on the impact that they have on people or wildlife. As you saw in the film, and I know many of you, most of you have watched it, you know, packaging, plastic packaging is a massive environmental problem. Um, but, and Niall has touched on this, there's the invisible pollutants as well. So the chemicals in the plastic packaging are also a problem, we're, and we're exposed to those when they migrate into the food and the drink we, we, we're taking in and, also, and that happens all the way from the manufacturing, the use, the disposal and the recycling. So um, over the last couple of years, ChemTrust has been involved in a project with other civil society organisations and also academic scientists, both based in the US and also in Sweden. And we wanted to look at what are the hazardous chemicals that are being used in plastic packaging. Now, this is all plastic packaging, but obviously huge amounts of plastic packaging are used um, for food and drink. Um, we realised that actually there was no one place that we could find where all of the chemicals, a list of all the chemicals that are used in plastic packaging. So we had to create a database. And by putting that database together, we, we found out that there's over 4,000 chemicals either used in the manufacture of the plastic packaging or in the plastic packaging itself in the final product. And of those chemicals, at least 148 are, were identified as particularly hazardous. So particularly hazardous either to human health or the environment or to both. And because some of those chemicals in the, you know, the 4,000 didn't have any data at all, no data on toxicity. So that 148 is a very conservative estimate of the number of chemicals that were hazardous. 35 of those chemicals were particularly concerning because they are known endocrine disruptors. Now, endocrine disruptors chemicals interfere with our very sensitive hormone system. That's the system that controls our metabolism, our growth and our development. And the groups of those, and I'm sorry to have to put sort of names here that might not be familiar, familiar to people, but groups of chemicals that are particularly concerning that are endocrine disruptors are the bisphenols, the phthalates 
and the PFAS chemicals. And even though these may be present in very small amounts in the plastic packaging, they may be migrating out of the plastic packaging into our food and drink in very small amounts. Unfortunately, these chemicals have an impact. They, you know, at a very low dose. And also we're exposed to mixtures of these chemicals from many different sources in our daily life. These are in everyday products. So if we take an example of, um, this is an infographic here showing the sorts of chemicals that have an impact on brain development, particularly at a very, very vulnerable time, which is when the, the fetus is developing and the brain is developing the fetus. Um, you've got chemicals having an impact on the developing brain that are coming from our food packaging, from um, our electronic screens, from the furniture in our house, from till receipts that you're picking up when you're going shopping from pesticides on our food from clothing and from cookware and they are all working together unfortunately to bring to be you know to impact on our health and that's just thinking about the chemicals that have an impact on brain development the other health impacts that link to endocrine disrupting chemicals and their fertility problems the hormone related cancers and there's obesity and diabetes so it's absolutely imperative both for human health and also for protection of wildlife that we get these most hazardous chemicals out of plastics and other products. And this is also really important in the context of the circular economy. We know, and you've seen that in the film, that you know, recycling is not the final solution, but it is part of the solution. And you can't have a clean circular economy when you have hazardous chemicals cycling through that again and again. And you can end up with unintended consequences. You can end up with chemicals in products that shouldn't be there. So when black plastic electronic waste is recycled into other products, such as um, plastic utensils or children's toys, those products end up with flame retardants in. And those flame retardants should not be in those products and therefore we get exposed to them in a way that shouldn't be happening. So <clears throat> just to um, conclude on this, we need far more information about what chemicals are used in plastics we, and we definitely need to know what their toxicity is. There's a real lack of transparency. It's very hard for scientists and for civil society groups to get hold of that information. We, absolutely need restrictions on the use of the most hazardous chemicals in plastics especially in our food packaging those chemicals we know they migrate into the food so we need to be increasing the use of inert packaging and also obviously environmentally we also need to be using reusable inert reusable packaging especially for food packaging and for storage and the wonderful opportunity that we have over the next um, few years is that there is going to be revision of EU legislation on, on food contact materials that so that is food packaging so we're going to be able to make sure hopefully um, by working together as a movement to make sure that basically our the materials that come into contact with our food are free from hazardous chemicals to protect both human health but also the environment. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> that was really great. Um, just to remind everyone watching that you can, the best way to ask questions that will hopefully be answered in some shape or form later is in the Q&A tab. So just to remind you that that's the best place to go to. Um, okay, and up next we have Megan. So fire away, Megan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, so I'm gonna break ranks here. I'm not gonna do slides. Um, I'm just going to try and tell you a bit about uh, the type of work that we do in Friends of the Earth that relates both to plastics uh, and to, to climate change. So I'm going to build heavily on what Andy finished on. Okay. Um, I guess my story around all this started a few years ago. Uh, I worked in an organisation that used an excessive amount of bubble wrap on everything. Um, and it kind of disgusted me. So I decided to go and do a, a little research project uh, and figured out that bioplastics actually comes from fossil fuels. Um, and it really surprised me and actually had an impact on our practices there, um, as not many people realised that 
that's actually where uh, a lot of plastics come from. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was also heavily involved in the Sick of Plastic Shop and Drop campaign um, that Friends of the Earth and Voice Ireland ran as part of the Sick of Plastic campaign. So that was again trying to challenge um, part of this model, but really at the, at, the, at the demand end. So getting people to go into their supermarkets and say, no, I don't want this excessive plastic, take it back. Um, yeah, not for me. So uh, there are two kind of leverage points that we can look at. And I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit today about uh, another one that we can look at that really was highlighted very strongly in the film and that's that's looking at, at source at where this feedstock for plastics comes from what companies are producing it and where it's being pushed in the world and um, so in this short seven minutes uh, i'm going to tell you a little bit about gas as a fossil fuel why it's so bad and uh, make that link between gas and the plastics industry and uh, tell you a little bit about fracking what that is and why it's so harmful you'll know what LNG stands for, uh, and you know how Ireland is complicit in offshoring injustices to the United States. Um, and you'll also know how Cher, the Pope, and the Hulk are also implicated in this. Um, so natural gas, which is lauded as a transition fuel, is actually a climate bomb. It's about 100 times uh, more potent of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And this is really recent research. Uh, and it really shows that we have to be targeting gas when we're trying to target uh, climate change and we're trying to reduce the impact of the planet. Um, so the Earth's climate system basically because of that responds a lot more quickly to gas, uh, in particular to the, the main component in gas which is called methane, way more quickly than it does to carbon dioxide which, which gives us an opportunity to tackle climate change by tackling gas. Um, bringing more gas on stream at this critical moment is just absolutely ludicrous. Um, but yeah, governments around the world including Ireland are, are doing it. Um, and the United Nations, if most of you will know, this IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change 2018 report, they said that if we are to stay within the safe threshold of warming, um, we can't be bringing any more gas on stream, we can't be increasing methane emissions. If we do that, we'll overshoot the, the two degrees mark uh, within 20 to 30 years. So in a nutshell, gas is bad for the climate. Um, so what's less well known about gas is that uh, it contains, as well as methane, ethane, which is wet gas that Andy mentioned. Uh, and this is the main ingredient used for making petrochemicals into plastic. So if you imagine a fossil fuel plant and extracting gas, extracting oil, a lot of this material that they take out of the earth is then used to be put into plastics. And um, so all of these companies you might have heard of, Shell, Exxon, ConocoPhillips, Deep, um, Dow, DuPont, all of those fossil fuel companies are also involved in producing plastics. Um, it's a huge market for them. And they're actually getting more and more invested in plastics as they realize that their time for producing fossil fuels is, is running out pretty fast. Um, having markets for plastics gives them a safe bet for the future. So they're, they're really increasing the amount that they, that they produce um, and the amount that they sell to companies like Ineos, which Andy also mentioned. Uh, and this gas I'm speaking about, it's, it's accessed via uh, an unconventional form of exploration called hydraulic fracturing, or more commonly known as fracking. Uh, you might have heard of this in Ireland because we banned fracking in 2017. And um, it was a really great campaign, lots of community groups working together, such as Love Leitrim, um, also working with Friends of the Earth to campaign to stop fracking in the island of Ireland. Uh, in the Republic of Ireland, it's banned, not yet in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so that was a huge success. Uh, but now Ireland wants to import fracked gas from the US. So gas is bad, we don't want it, we're going to ban fracking, but it's okay, we're just going to import it. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're, we're planning on importing LNG, which stands for liquefied natural gas, which is gas turned into liquid, unsurprisingly. Um, and we're planning on building import terminals for this, uh, one in Shannon and one in Cork. Um, these plants uh, are planned by two companies called Next Decade and New Fortress. Uh, and they're really pushing very, very strongly for these to be built. Um, and they are lobbying at the level of the EU, they're lobbying at the level of the Irish government. Um, so there's been huge campaigns in Ireland against this. Um, and I mentioned Cher earlier, so if you look up Cher, Shannon LNG, you'll see her tweet which says that 
she's completely against um, sham mill energy um, because of the impact that hydraulic fracturing uh, and ore and exploration has on on um, all of sea life. So it's just a, an interesting point around share support for the anti sham mill energy campaign. Um, but Ireland is still is still planning on this, but we have a really strong opportunity now over the next couple of weeks uh, while the Irish programme for government is being deliberated upon. Um, the two main parties, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, who are trying to form a government, have said that they might um, prevent sham LNG from being built. Uh, so we really need to hold them to that. So I know everybody who's on this call cares about plastic. And if you care about plastic, you will very likely also care about gas and about stopping climate change. And now is a really good opportunity to contact your TDs and tell them you don't want that. This. So what they can do in particular is take Shannon LNG off what's called the, the PCI list at the European level. And that's the project's common interest. Um, and Shannon LNG is lauded as an, a project that's in the interest of all of the EU citizens. And for that reason, it gets a whole lot of money um, through what's called the Connecting Europe facility. Ireland can tell them that we don't want this. Um, so we need to keep telling our elected officials that we don't want this. Um, you can also join Campaign Group. It's an amazing group called Not Here, Not Anywhere, and it's rooted in solidarity. If we're not fracking here, don't push it elsewhere. And they're always looking for new members, so just, just look them up. Uh, and we have an action on our website in Friends of the Earth that you can take to email your TDs and tell them you don't want fracking here, you don't want fracking fracked gas, you don't want fracking in Northern Ireland. Um, you don't want any fracking, basically. So go to our website, take that action. And in the next few weeks, we'll also have an opportunity for you to be able to shape that PCI process, uh, which will be changed over the next couple of years. And it's looking likely that it will be changed in the favor of no more gas, because lots and lots of research is coming out now um, to say that we don't need it. Um, renewables are the way to go. Um, and I said, I mentioned the Hulk. So if you look up Mark Ruffalo, and Shannon LNG, he is a massive advocate for, for stopping uh, new gas projects, particularly because he has a huge vested interest in stopping fracking in the US, and he's a huge activist over there. So uh, look up Share Shannon LNG, uh, The Hulk, or Marco Flo Shannon LNG for a bit of light entertainment, uh, and go take those actions. Cool. Thanks, Megan. Up next, we have Sorka. And, um, Sorka is going to talk to us about the Conscious Cup campaign and maybe some mm. other things. Thanks, Sorka. Okay. No worries. Um, now, I just share this. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here discussing this this evening. Um, and it's great to see loads of names that I recognise who are attending. So hi to everybody. Um, a lot of you will obviously know me. And for those that don't, I work on the Conscious Cup campaign for the last three years, um, coordinating it. And um, the aim it really is to reduce single use, um, not just with cups, but ultimately with lots of other products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I've been working with consumers, the food to go industry, government bodies, universities, community groups, everybody basically, because it's, it's really the responsibility of all of us to work together. And the strength and community in Ireland has been just absolutely wonderful in creating change. Um, very, very supportive. The, I'll just flick through to the next one. So I was going to actually talk about the single use plastics directive. Um, and it's very relevant really to what we're doing, what we're talking about this evening. So the EU single use plastics directive was brought about because of the marine litter that we had a huge issue with. And it addresses the items that are the most popular uh, that turn up on our beaches. So from mid 2021, there will actually be a considerable amount of items that will be banned um, by this directive. Ireland is currently uh, transposing this uh, into our own uh, legal system. So um, it's being worked on and there, it won't be slowed, um, which is great to hear. Um, so as you can see there, from mid 2021, plastic cutlery, plates, beverage stirrers, straws, they will actually be banned from July next year. So anybody who's still buying them really needs to start <laughs> reducing 
their purchasing and diminishing their stocks. Um, and I'm talking about industry really when, I'm, when I say that they need to reduce their purchasing and plan. Uh, expanded polystyrene cups and containers would be completely banned, which is wonderful because they do have carcinogenic uh, issues attached to them. And oxo-degradable plastics will also be banned. Um, then moving on, the next stage will be reductions for cups and containers and food, con sorry, beg your pardon, cups for beverages and food containers. So we have to achieve reduction, uh, reductions in these items and it's going to affect everybody basically between manufacturers, producers, retailers, importers and all of the brand companies who are putting these items on the market. Franz Timmermans is the head of the new green, the Green New Deal in Europe, and he is he's the person really who is charging and forging ahead with the single use plastics directive. He recently was written to by lobbyists from the packaging industry um, when COVID started because they wanted to uh, basically say, can we slow down the implementation of the single use plastics directive because, you know, single use products are actually safer for people considering we're going through a pandemic and thankfully he said he didn't really appreciate being written to by them and he is not going to take any uh, measures um, with regard to people uh, lobbying in that instance because he doesn't see any relationship at all um, and he knows that the planet ultimately is in danger if we don't change the system. Um, so 40% of all plastic made globally is for single use packaging. And the way that we address that is not by necessarily moving from one product to another um, because that's still some single use. We need to move right up our waste hierarchy up to prevention. I'm very aware that a lot of you in this group are, you know, very advanced on your journey about what I'm talking about. So a lot of this isn't really new to you, but perhaps to some people it isn't. So I'm trying to keep it as general as possible. And when we actually move up the waste hierarchy towards waste prevention and reuse is how we do that as well. Um, we also look after lots of different things, like including the uh, sustainable development goals. And we have a responsibility really to the countries who suffer the most when we engage in overconsumption of single use. It's the, you know, often the countries that have huge amounts of litter are blamed for that. And the truth is that th those items come from the wealthier countries where the consumption is at its highest and they make their way there to those countries who don't have the money or the for to create a good infrastructure. But what we want to do is look at opportunities because there are opportunities and especially with COVID, we can very much see that, you know, what we need is system change and I've seen a lot of questions there coming up in relation to material, like what if we look at this material and what if we, we go to uh, another type of, you know, bioplastics. Um, the important thing here is it's not really about the product, the material being sust sustainable. It's about it's about working it with a sustainable system because not one product is going to fit every solution. So we've got the likes of these veg boxes, which is absolutely fantastic all around the country. Everybody wants a veg box at the moment and all of the local farmers are suffering because they can't actually get them out quick enough. There's a huge demand and the benefits for this, if we go long term and stick to how we, you know, changing how we purchase things, there's huge benefits because we've little or no packaging. The boxes themselves are reused. We've less food waste because when you get your box, you actually plan out your meals you know what products you've got for the week and you, you work to uh, your menu to that. And when we source locally, one of the big things we do is we avoid all those flights coming in with food that we already produce in this country and the carbon emissions that are associated with that. So, you know, some great companies out there like Green Earth Organics and Small Changes, and there are other companies who are emerging like Sprout and, you know, other farms around the country who are supplying veg boxes but they're not really in tune maybe with the zero waste movement so keep asking them if you're getting a box 
just get rid of the packaging as well. You don't need that packaging. And, and if, you, if, you, if you do need packaging, you can use a paper bag, which is returnable the following week as well. They're perfectly reusable. But right now, what we need to do is change the conversation when we're ordering takeaways as well. That's something that we can do. We've got a massive rise in uh, takeaway orders happening. Uh, you only have to walk down the street and you can see, you know, sachets and cutlery as well. But as consumers, we can change that conversation. And it takes training because behavior breeds behavior. And if we actually, when we're ordering, we specifically you know, draw attention to the fact that we don't want any unnecessary throwaways. Why do we need cutlery? We have it at home. You know, pizza boxes coming with little plastic condiments and you don't even use them or need them. So if we can actually say no, and we can actually encourage the businesses equally to ask do when they're taking an order, they should always ask, do we need these items as well, instead of just automatically supplying them. We've seen it with, you know, reusable cups, how we change the conversation. And we've actually, Ireland has performed very, very well for bring your own, even just with a discount. With the latte levy coming in, you know, there will be significant consumer change. And we also have a recircle pilot um, for containers in UCC Cork. So that's for your takeaway containers, which is absolutely wonderful. Tad is heading that up in UCC. It's just a matter of getting used to changing how we shop. And that just takes time. Okay, sorry. And I'll just fly through these. Some simple solutions. Um, so you've got reusable uh, coffee there. You can see how suppliers like uh, uh, Cloud Picker are actually changing how they deliver their coffee into their um, cafes in returnable, reusable containers. Cree restaurant there on the top. They simply worked with their local producers and made sure that all of their local produce arrived in returnable reusable containers and the bottom right you've got loop and this is the future it is the, the way people shop is going to change and lastly i just want to say um a couple of resources down there on the bottom that you can look at go zero for relative to ireland it's a directory map of local stores selling plastic free goods how to Save Your Planet, One Object at a Time, a new book that's by Dr. Tara Shine for people who want to start their journey, um, and Living Lightly in Ireland, Sustainable Living blog by Elaine Butler, who does amazing research on everything that she puts up on that website and, her, and on her blogs, well worth looking at. And just in case you think reusable cups are not going to come back, I have a little video to show you what's going on in other countries. Um, and this comes from Takeaway Throwaways in New Zealand and it'll actually prove that reusable is the safest option with contactable contactless because nobody touches the cup at all in this instance whereas if you buy a disposable takeaway coffee hopefully this video will work <laughs> if you buy a disposable takeaway coffee someone's touching it Ooh. okay so it looks like my video doesn't really want to work at the moment. Perhaps there's a way we can get that to people later, Sorka? Yeah, I can do that it, later. It is really interesting. I'd love to okay. see that. <laughs> um, just to finish up from our, uh, <laughs> our panel, it's not, not for the evening, of course, but last we have, but not least, Angela. Uh, so Angela, off you go now. Yeah, so I'm going to go like Megan and I'm going to go slide free. Um, so first of all, I just kind of want to give people an overview of Sick of Plastic. It's kind of been touched on a couple of times throughout the evening, but um, it was formed in 2018 um, and it's like the child of uh, Friends of the Earth and Voice. So it's facilitated by those two NGOs and Sick of Plastic, as the name implies, is specifically looking at the plastic problem. Um, so one thing that really struck me from the movie um, when I watched it was that the plastic issue for me, it's really a supply issue. It's coming from producers and suppliers and it's, we're kind of, it makes me think that we're walking, you know, blindfolded down an alley into this massive problem. And a lot of us aren't really actually that conscious of it. We go shopping and everything's wrapped in plastic. And if you're not really tuned into this topic, you can quite easily just pick it all up and shop and not think any differently of it. So what Sick of Plastic is trying to do is to 
gather support all across the country. Um, we've got groups set up all across the country and what we're trying to do is facilitate local groups to come together and to work in their local area, particularly targeting their own supermarkets because um, as a lot of people have other, and CERC has talked about trying to deal with the takeaway industry and, and the much wider issue. And if you want to change your shopping habits to go to local markets and farmers markets, while all those things are really good, for some people, they just want to go to the supermarket and do their shopping in the supermarket. So it's it's a massive issue that we need to address. We can't just assume that everybody's going to change their shopping habits really quickly. Um, so what we're trying to do is put pressure on suppliers um, and producers uh, for supermarkets. Um, so we're doing that really, Sorry. the way we've been doing it so far is in direct action. Um, our most successful campaign so far has been the shop and drop action, um, where we've got uh, 69 groups set up all across the country and they come together they encourage people to turn up on a specific day. it's been happening nationwide for two days for the last two years we were supposed to have one in april of this year but unfortunately covid has put an, an end to that for the moment it will be back um but people do their shopping and once they've paid and at the till they unwrap their their shopping from all the packaging and they simply leave it behind they shop it and they drop it they leave the packaging there and it's really to send a message to the supermarkets that we don't want this. You're giving it to us as a supply issue, but there is no demand here for it. So we want to illustrate that it's the demand is not there. Um, so we're really trying to change people's behavior on that, on that local level. We also have policy focus on trying to bring in a deposit refund scheme and the tax that would be coming in on the coffee cups. So the campaign is a little bit more spread than just the shop and drop, but that is really one of our, one of our main aims. Um, so we're really just asking people to get involved as much as possible. Um, we're organized through voice, so you can check out the voice website and find the Sick of Plastic uh, project there and you'll get all the details there. Um, we'd like people to connect with us as much as they can across social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we really want to, people to also, we're running a campaign called Loose for Less, where one of the other demands we have for supermarkets is if you go shopping quite often the stuff that's packaged up pre-packaged is more expensive than the loose stuff which seems totally counterintuitive um so if you see instances where this happens uh we'd like people to take picture of it uh post it on whatever social medium you like tag the supermarket and tag us please and use the hashtag loose for less to find all those details on our website um so i know everyone that tuned in tonight obviously has an interest in plastic um, so we are really calling out for people to join with us because we need a really strong collective voice. Andy and the others who've spoken before us and Megan, we know we're up against the oil and gas industry. And that is a massive group that we're trying to lobby against. So we need to make our voice as loud as possible. So we need as many people to join with us um, and help us to try and Put together a strategy like i think we need a strategy for mainstream supermarkets for them to have plastic free aisles for them to change the way that shopping happens in the mainstream environment because it's it's not necessarily going to be applicable to everybody to turn their shopping habits completely on their head we need the mainstream supermarket providers to keep up with this demands as well um, so we want people to get in touch to join us and to help join our voices together and they don't need to wait for the nationwide shop and drops. They can do that at any point. Uh, they can obviously perhaps now is it's not going to be all that welcome with demands that are on in supermarkets. But as soon as life returns to some level of normality, uh, we'll encourage everybody to get back to the attitude of telling supermarket suppliers, producers that we don't want this plastic. So that's us. Thanks, Angela. Great stuff. So there's lots of information there um, to everyone who's watching. Um, it might feel a bit overwhelming at the moment. <laughs> a lot of really amazing uh, knowledge being shared. So if you have any questions, please do get in touch with, um, with anyone. With, you, can, you can ask in the questions and answers or you can get in touch with us directly. So before we move on to some questions from the participants watching, we have another poll. If given the chance, you would buy the following items and bring your own containers or bags. So we're going to launch that poll. So it is, if you're given the chance, would you buy the following items and bring your own containers or bags? Considering the captive audience we have, I'm pretty sure we'd love everything without single use. But for the crack, we'll do a poll. <laughs> to be specific for science. science 
yes, the science of numbers. Oh, here we go. Share results. Okay. <laughs> So 91% of our people said that they would use other containers if they could bring their own. 7% said they would do uh, fruit, veg, and dried goods. And 3% would just do fruit and veg. So people are willing to bring their containers. That's great. So keep in touch with us. Awesome. Yeah, lots of people here on the panel who can help you expand on that if you're having problems shopping without having to buy a ton of single-use plastic. Okay. Gonna stop sharing that and we'll go into some questions for our panel, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, my suggestion is people unmute for a while and if you're not answering, you can mute again. Is that okay? Just so that we can be a little more ad hoc about this. We've, um, so this is something I think about quite a lot. Um, Wendy Cox has asked, what exactly is happening in Ireland to the plastic waste we put in our green recycling bins? Is any of it actually recycled here? Can anyone answer that question or have any information on that? Would anyone like to put their hand up, Niall? Oh. Niall, you put your hand up there? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, my understanding, you know, Ireland has very good credentials in relation to recovery of materials for recycling. We, we don't actually operate recycling facilities in this country, essentially. There's one or two small outfits um, that can generate materials from recycled plastics, but really our capacity to handle the waste in this country is very limited um, yeah. and so as the same as I suppose much of what we saw in the documentary shipping out is our is our primary um, treatment process I'm afraid so we ship our problem to somebody else largely. And so just like in the story of plastic much of that goes to a whole host of different problems elsewhere. Yeah and we've had embarrassing scenarios I suppose in the past where containers of materials which weren't cleaned properly were completely mixed waste were being sent for recycling and they were refused entry so yeah you know that's that's the reality of, of how we handle our waste um, and we're also one of the largest producers of waste per capita in europe you know even though our credentials are good in terms of collection you have to balance out a lot of things when you when you look at the numbers you know or you have to accept the responsibility on a lot of levels i suppose and further to that question actually um on the idea that we are we create the most waste per capita let's say than at most countries um do we does anyone here have any can expand on perhaps why we as ireland are like that what is it a, a society um, as a whole, or Sorka, do you have anything to add to that? Well, one of the reasons is because we're an island, uh, and that uh, uh, that like dictates a lot of the food that is imported to us. Um, there's a lot of superfluous packaging that we really don't need if we source locally. So the fact that like mainland Europe would tend to have lower rates is because you know they're not flying food necessarily; they are transporting it as long distances as we are. Mm. That's just one. But there are other reasons, yeah. It's not a cultural thing. We don't believe that we have that regard to perhaps other um, I think as well, and we were talking about this the other day, that, you know, Ireland went through a very rapid growth with the Celtic Tiger as well. And we went from, you know, when, when, you, when you accelerate economic growth like that, you also, you know, develop like more disposable income as well well so our consumption went up as also we like i remember in 2000 we were probably the country that caught up so quickly with the rest of europe but it was very very fast paced um, so anna fitzgerald has a question and um, this might be a question for megan or andy well any anyone actually but it's what energy can ireland use if we don't use lng given that adequate resources have not been provided to renewable energy supplies do we have any plans in place um, so LNG in particular is definitely not required, even for the Gaelic Fianna Fáil said that in their response to the Green Party recently. So it's not required for security of energy supply. The Project Common Interest system is set up so that energy comes into Ireland and goes to the rest of Europe. But even looking at all of the gas facilities and energy use across Europe, um, the gas facilities that are there aren't being used to capacity at present. Only They're only being used to about 25% of capacity. So Ireland has huge um, wind resources and huge solar resources. Uh, wind produced, I don't know the exact figure, uh, but my colleagues in Stockholm and Chaos would if you go on that website. Okay. Um, wind produced a huge amount of our energy, like on windy days we produce a lot of energy basically. Um, but yeah. solar is something that we're not utilizing, utilizing at all really. Um, yeah. In Germany citizens are part of generating their own electricity. Um, if you have solar panels on your roof um, or any, any building you own or schools or anything, 
this generates electricity that can be fed into the grid and people can actually be paid for generating electricity. Ireland has blockages to that. That's right. Now, why is that, Megan? Why is it, if I've asked this question before in groups like this, uh, why do you believe we are not uh, using these facilities, let's say, or the, this, the access to this sort of power? Why do you think we're not using it? There's a lot of bureaucratic barriers to it. There's like a, a renewable energy feed-in tariff that just requires a lot of technical changes to, to the grid. It is possible, um, but the, the Commission for the Regulation of, of Energy is dragging its feet on it, and it's not allowing what's called a, like an energy auction to happen very often. So it means that uh, individual consumers don't get an opportunity to be part of it because it's only there for huge um, producers uh, of, pe of energy, people that have companies that have a lot of capacity to, to build these huge companies that don't take the, the locals along with them. So there has been a lot of resistance to that sort of model in Ireland because yeah. it was really badly, like poorly done with wind. A lot of land was given away to huge wind developers. And a lot of that energy was exported abroad. So, so people are rightly a bit worried about yeah. uh, all of these huge companies taking up land and generating energy for their own profit that doesn't go back to, to the people. Um, so it is understandable it needs to be done in a democratic way and Germany is a really really great example. Um, if you go over there, any of you that have been there, pick solar panels everywhere um, and people are really part of that transition. Awesome. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in just to, to reassure or inform our participants that we have lots of questions and to read them all, some of them are repeating themselves. So just to um, let me do a little quick sift through some of them. Um, one of the other big questions that's come in is what does a single, single, what does a single use free uh, country, let's say, or society look like? And that's a huge question. And um, it's more like it, it's blue skies thinking at this stage because we have such a massive problem. But would anyone like to jump in and and answer that that broad question about what, what a single use free a society might look like or what the practicalities of that would be? I think it has to, can I talk? Thanks Orca. Yeah, uh, just briefly, I, I, I think it's the whole system change like we need from, um, uh, in terms of how we shop. So as consumers, if we keep saying that we want change, then it puts that pressure on the retailers to change the way they deliver products to us. And just to refer to Loop, which is uh, Tom Saki is the CEO of Loop and they are doing phenomenal work um, that, because what they're doing is they're working with the big brands um, and they are offering like a reuse system. They've trialed it and it's a reuse system within the supermarkets. So you're actually going to, you know, be able to uh, deliver to the people who don't shop like the rest like a lot of us shop here you know um, and when you when you go for the masses that way you can actually really upscale change quite quickly so uh he reported that they've had their busiest month in march even with COVID. So well, there is, so it's really, really good news because there's some fears around reuse with COVID at the moment, but that's not happening with them. And uh, interesting, he made a point that it's actually the media who are really kind of pushing all this scaremongering around reuse with COVID. Okay, thanks, Orga. That's good news. Uh, Angela? I just think really a lot of it, what it might look like, we might just need to hold a mirror up and look back to where we used to be. Um, like a lot of people used to, do a smaller shop, shop locally, get what they needed for the next couple of days and move on. And, and things weren't coming through this massive supply chain. So it was, it was shopping more locally, shopping more directly. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, while it is blue skies thinking, we probably do have a blueprint. Yeah, a really good one. Yeah. According to my, uh, my, my mother and um, her very uh, basic childhood, she'd say, um, there were a lot of glass bottles involved. Um, that sounds quite dodgy, but you know what I mean? Um, so one of the big things that comes into my mind, and it's a question that we had as a group we were chatting yesterday, is that can anyone offer any insight into the psychology of people, and maybe some of you guys are the participants watching, involved in the oil and gas industry? I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the people with, with real power. Um, is it purely just lucrative business to them and they totally block out the, uh, the, cat, the catastrophe, basically, or the, the negative consequences of their actions? It's something that I certainly think about quite a lot. Um, 
because obviously everyone here is certainly on one side um, and it's a side for the better of the better of the planet. Um, does anyone have any insight or has they thought, probably they have wondered about the mindset of the, uh, the money, the people behind oil and gas, the, the, the people behind this plastic industry essentially? I wouldn't pretend to be a psychologist, but I, no. I would just make the point that it's not a new phenomenon. No, of course. You mentioned there a while ago about being an island. And when plastic bottles first really started taking off um, in the 70s, New York as an island really spotted the problem because it had to ship the waste off. It saw it accumulating on the docks. And so it actually banned the plastic bottles for a period, but that was overturned in the Supreme Court almost immediately in 1972. So this lobby and, and pressure that's been there really is a long term. Same thing happened in Hawaii, again, an island state. They tried to ban um, or put a levy on plastic materials and that was stopped back in the 70s as well. So this is not a new phenomenon, if you like, or a new psychology. It's a, it's a business model, I suppose, that's been operating. Yeah, I, I guess the main issue, I mean, obviously people are saying you're profit, profit. Well, obviously there's a huge profit in oil. It's never, it's not a secret. Um, but it's always been a curious thing to me, that's an understatement, to wonder how you, for example, you know, you force oil on certain, uh, well, the industry is such a, a dangerous one and not even getting into the politics of it, um, about what kinds of people uh, want to keep pushing oil and drilling for oil and drilling and fracking. Um, I mean, that's a whole other webinar on the psychology of uh, the kinds of, of human beings that are, are are bringing this this problem to us every day because and one of the things and maybe someone else could expand on this um is that you know when you think of oil a lot of the people watching might know this already you think of just oil you think of heating your home you think of of, of driving your car but obviously we're here because it's it's at the core of the plastic problem um and i think i think andy you you went to say something there did you and i just started talking do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, um, I've, I've, I, I've just highlighted some issues of, of the, this company named Ineos. Um, the interesting thing about them is that they're owned by one man, in actual fact, and is one of the richest men in the UK. Um, and they've turned from a pure petrochemical company into an upstream producer of oil and gas in order to have the full control of, of their own life chain of production. That's the reason why they, they wanted to become, you know, the, the biggest wannabe frack in the United Kingdom. And, and it was really, um, it was a, a huge force for mobilizing as soon as people realized that this, this fracking in, in the UK is not even, not even um, in order to produce electricity or, or heating. But just to give you some numbers, why, why oil and, and gas is, is pushing, they, they have invested in the US alone in, in over 300 new projects worth $200 billion. So we're talking about petrochemical facilities that will go online within the next 30 to 50 years that have an economic lifespan that go way beyond 2050 when we need to be at net zero. So the answer is, the oil and gas industry realizes that they need to die. So they're looking for markets where they can survive. And plastics is, is a huge market where they can survive. And they see growth opportunities because they have this global perspective. We are quite mature markets, but they see the world, you know, they see Africa, they see Asia. So they see huge markets coming online within the next few decades. So that's why they're heavily investing in new petrochemical facilities that no one needs. They will produce more single-use plastics, but this gives them an escape out of, of, out of their, their um, original business and, and secures a perspective also for investors. So that's why I've said, um, maybe I didn't stress this enough, the, the plastic crisis is definitely a supply-driven crisis as, as it is a demand driven uh, crisis. And we need to make people aware of the fact that yes, it's important to act as consumers, but we need to stop these new facilities going online because they will just keep flooding us with, with a lot of single use plastics. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Does anyone else want to, there's another question that keeps coming up. 
one person talked about the um, the sense of loss and having watched the documentary and the sense of uh, feeling helpless and do we does for example how do you all continue to do the work that you do where does your hope lie in order to keep pushing for better health um, better use of, of of sustainable products and and so forth. Is anyone? I'm sure you all have very strong feelings and are up and down about it all the time. But does anyone here, Megan and Anna? So maybe Megan first, yeah. you could answer. I'm going to be a bit cheesy. There's a quote that I like to tell people because I get asked this question a lot. <laughs> here we go. Um, we want it. We need it. <laughs> action is the antidote to despair. Yeah. So um, I'm involved in lots of groups, and I mentioned Nanya anywhere earlier, and there's also um, a group called the Dublin Eco Fens and yeah it's really the community and the people together and also my colleagues Frank Surf and Andy on the European level and it's like the prospects are bleak nobody is denying that but it is a lot easier to kind of just try uh, even though the prospects are bleak when you're when you're with a lot of other people so if you're not involved in a group already and um, there's like so many around Ireland and if you haven't heard of the the One Future campaign um, it's an initiative with lots of social justice and climate and faith-based organizations and health professionals all coming together to try and create a new vision for a different society based not on growth and not on profit but on principles of justice and equity and they'll be um, facilitating people to, to cultivate their own local groups and um, some of them are already starting to form on the back of the, the last general election in Ireland so it's really motivating to see people actually connecting and some of the stuff that people say, like feeling so alone beforehand and I feel like I can do something. So it's just, yeah. I it's think it's just it's finding energy. the people, it's, even yeah. if it seems weak, I think it's just, that's the main yeah, that's thing. Been, that's been my way of dealing with some of the, the panic. Anna, you were going to say something? Well, I mean, Megan's absolutely right. And we're obviously, you know, we're very lucky, you know, we're, I mean, I'm a professional campaigner. I spend my day on Zoom calls with amazing people from across Europe um, talking about how we can act on this together. And I know I'm very lucky and I know there'll be lots of people here watching this that think, well, you know, I'm just here in my community and my family, what can I do? And I would also want to say, you know, any small steps you can take is absolutely fine. We know it's a massive problem you know, there are big movements that are working on this. And so even coming along to this, you know, learning more about it, talking to your friends and family about it, um, you know, looking out for more information, sharing it on social media, even if, you know, you, you may have children, you may have a very, very stressful job, you might be doing something that is so important that you can only do small things, but please also those small steps are very, very important. And just showing up, to uh, something on an evening when we've got busy lives is also just amazing. So yeah. really getting inspiration from people, that is the main thing. I've been an environmental campaigner for over 20 years. My partner works on climate change. You know, it's our entire life, but just being around people that um, can give you, you know, you, you know, you can draw on them when you're going through a bad time as well. And, yeah, you know, it, it, and they can give you that support. Yeah. It is just fantastic. Um, so do talk to people, share how you're feeling, share the information you're finding out. That's something that I think is really helpful. Andy? Sorry. Thanks, Andy. No, um, sorry. May I? Yeah. Yes, please. Sure. I just, I just wanted to say um, the, the one main thing that motivates me over and over again is you know, we're fighting this, these big companies. And, and at, when, you, when you start, you know, with a campaign or, or when you see something and it seems so big, no matter if it's climate change, petrochemical industry, plastic industry. But the fact of the matter is we're fighting them with just, you know, a handful of people. And we're able to fight back. And this is something that people need to realize, you know, it seems huge, but as soon as you start, you know, punching back, they're not as hard as they seem. And, 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 and in a lot of, um, you know, cases, they lack basic knowledge. I mean, they, they simply do a shitty job. And, and, and if you're willing to, to kind of like, you know, really invest your time and, and, and educate yourself and, and, and really start doing something bit by bit, just as Anna said, you know, you will soon start and also reach out to, pe to other people, find other people like, like Megan has said, other groups. 
you'll soon start to realize that this change is possible. It's not just a dream and, and we can be much faster and much more efficient than we might think if we're, you know, alone in our own depression bubble, you know, seeing this. So, so this, is, this is the thing that motivates me. From my own experiences, I, I saw that things that seemed impossible are possible. Uh, yeah, point. Thank you, Angela. Sorry, I wasn't ready to unmute. Um, so yeah, I mean, following on from pretty much what everyone else has said, but I guess um, from my own personal experience, I don't feel through the Sick of Plastic campaign that I'm necessarily taking on big industry directly. What I'm doing is I'm connecting with people in my locality and we're sharing knowledge and we're working, we're trying to work with our local supermarkets to make a change. So it's a lot less intimidating and a lot less smaller, but it also provides a sense of community that perhaps sometimes people talk about they're lacking in certain times. So that for me, it's, it, it's a much more positive experience and it doesn't have to be quite so scary that you can start small with, with small issues and you build up from there rather than trying to take on the world as an individual. Um, is it possible? It's a big question and it's for people who probably, uh, is it possible to, to, as a group of activists, let's say, if everyone who's watching tonight isn't already, doesn't already consider themselves an activist, but now is one because they're here and they're talking about it, hopefully talking about it beyond tonight. Um, can we take on big oil and gas um, and can we get somewhere? What is the, can, it's a big question, but is there a, a short answer to what the answer is to that? How do we defeat the supplier? Andy? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to help you too much. Uh, okay. No, but if you can, you know, it's that big question. We can talk for hours about if we want to give people a sense of well-being and that they're actually doing something good, like Angela's helping and, and, and Sorka's campaign um, to empower people. Um, and it is helping send a message to the higher powers or the powers that be. But is there a way of stopping the, the, the supply? Yes, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long way sometime and you'll have to fight different fights. It's important to connect along the supply chain in this business because it's a global business. This is like one of my main tasks is to make sure that, that the people are in touch in the US with the people in Europe that are fighting the same company and the supply chain. But again, I mean, look at the anti-LNG campaign in Shannon. When we started this, two and a half years ago, it was just a handful of people that talked about it. And now it's a massive movement and, and um, it, it's absolutely feasible that you'll stop this or, or even if you go further back and you've implemented a fantastic fracking ban in Ireland that seemed impossible. Um, and, and we've stopped in actual fact INEOS from really developing their new plants at Antwerp and with regard to the UK, we, we've, um, we've also stopped them from developing fracking in the UK for the time being. But this has cost them um, over 100 million pounds. I mean, these are losses that they have to admit now in their reports. So, so you see how you, you can actually read in numbers what our impact is. Yeah, great. I mean, I'm always hopeful. And um, joining any of the groups that have been mentioned today is always a good way to get more information on how you can be part of the change, I guess, or push for change. So if you want to ask any questions of them directly, whether that might be, um, I hate to put this on everyone's plate, but to ask them about where they might be able to get more plastic free options, where they might be able to join these groups. Say to everybody. Um, I'm going to, they can join the groups that are, uh, behind all of the campaigns that, that Megan and Andy and Anna and Niall and Angela are working with and for. Um, we've, we're nearly at time. Um, I wondered if anyone wanted to, on the panel, wanted to say something. It's, again, it's such a huge topic. So to cover it in depth would be impossible after you know, watching the documentary so informative in itself. But does anyone here want to say anything that, I mean, I'm going to say something that has been missed, which is an understatement. But Niall, do you want to say something? I just make a comment, I suppose, that, you know, it's, it can, there can be a sense of despair, as people have said, when you look at this issue and the scale of it, and you can feel quite small. And, and 
but yeah, there was a time in this country where, where when you watch the six o'clock news, you were looking at fish deaths in every river almost around the country on a weekly basis because of dumping into rivers and things like that. And then legislation came in and our environment is completely different. It's not perfect yet, but it's completely different. So legislation is on the way as well as backing this and other speakers have raised that point. So there's going to be a combination of solutions, I suppose, consumer based. Yeah, and I've mentioned that it is very challenging to do so. Or, you know, if you look at current reports, PPE is probably going to be a major pollution issue now after this event, if you like. It's just the way, but those are the materials we have at hand today, but things are changing. I may have given the impression that bioplastics is not um, a viable alternative. It is, and there's things happening in the country in relation to that too. Uh, Glanbia, the dairy processor, got 22 million from uh, the EU to produce lactic acid that will be made into biodegradable polylactic acid, truly biodegradable material that you can put into composting. Now that's industrial composting, but it's still it's a material that will disappear over time. Okay. So there are advances at a technical level that are happening as well as legislation coming in behind, and it's, it's slow at the moment. The pressure needs to be kept on by people. You know, someone was asking what can consumers do. Keep pressure on, join the groups people have talked about, make your voice heard, you know, um, try and make the choices you can, accepting that it's difficult to do so. But you, you, you do have an impact, even in the smallest possible ways. You do have an impact in the choices yeah. that you make as well. So yeah. there are positive things happening also. Yeah. Anna? I know there's been a couple of questions asking about PPE and COVID, which yeah, I think is absolutely, you know, it's top of people's mind. And I just wanted to share with you some <clears throat> something that's really positive. So one of the members of the Break Free from Plastic movement in Portugal, they're involved in a project working with um, the health service, the ministry in Portugal, and also universities to develop reusable PPE, um, looking at what textiles can be used, how it could be um, basically disinfected in-house within the hospitals and again this not only is that environmentally um, better and obviously we're concerned about that but also it means that it's more resilient for the health service for that to happen because you are use, you're in control of it you're not waiting for those supply chains and mm -hmm. I don't know how it's been in Ireland but obviously the supply chain has been a massive problem within the UK mm -hmm. and you know our health workers and frontline workers are not having good access to PPE so you know the Break Free from Plastic movement is full of organisations that are actually also demonstrating what the solutions are to some of these huge problems. Not only that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling and we're, fighting, you know, we're, we're joining in each other's struggles across the globe. We're also coming forward with ways that um, these problems can be addressed. So I just wanted to end on that, Thanks, you know, Anna. on that sort of element of hope there um it's not to say it's going to solve it all but oh. i think i just wanted to share that with people because i know there have been a lot of questions about that yeah because single use has been a real on people's minds consistently when we watch the, t the tv and it's just it's 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 the ppe topic is huge um and therefore you you wonder how much more plastic we're going to have to deal with afterwards and sorka what did you want to say very quickly um i listened to a very good podcast the other day uh, uh and it was by a nurse actually who wor uh, works in hospitals, greening hospitals in New York. And she was a nurse in the eighties and pretty much everything was reusable back then. It's just, we took this huge shift to disposables it's all about having proper sanitization systems in place and that applies to every product we use if we create that system we will be able to avoid single use another quick thing is just to say single use plastic directive also includes compostable packaging bio-based packaging those items will be affected and they will be banned in july next year too so it is it, it, it's important that we you know move to reuse systems as opposed to from one single use to another and and i know there's loads of questions there and someone asked a question from a tidy towns and um, what they could do because of the cup situation maybe at the moment i try and engage with all the takeaways but go very gently because you know all the businesses it's really sensitive and hard for them trying to get back on track and there it's a lot of stress for them to try and deal with how to you know how to stay in business how to look after their employees how to trade safely so if you can maybe approach in a nice gentle way you know about the conversation about the disposables that we don't really need you know just the ones we don't really need always go for the hanging fruit first it's much easier and and when you win those battles then it makes it easier to go on to the bigger ones you know yeah it's a tough one because as we keep saying um at the moment there's a huge amount of single use um uh, in the system more than more than ever because we're taking meals from restaurants that would ordinarily serve it to us on, on crockery etc etc so there's a, a huge surge of that um 
and I guess we we're prior we have to prioritize our, our health or well Anna would argue that's not healthy and it's true but anyway um there are it's um, been incredible the response from people watching and it's consistently growing here and it's a really rousing thing because I know myself watching the documentary again this week and it is quite a difficult topic to to not worry about all the time and you see it everywhere you go I'm in the countryside now and I see I still see plastic in in everything I'm using or have been given um so I wanted to say thank you to Angela and everybody in in Voice Ireland and Friends of the Earth um to Sorka, Anna, Niall, Megan and Andy and everyone behind the scenes who are trying to send me all the information as we go it is I don't know if anyone out there has tried to host a zoom panel it's really stressful <laughs> but it's so worth it so thank you to everybody who who part or who part took today and all of you who are watching it's it's really really um it's really What's the word I'm looking for? It's making me really happy is what I wanted to say. I've lost her words. There's so many words on my screen. Um, what I wanted to say as well is that please do get in touch with Voice or Friends of the Earth as two basic, two, two groups that will be able to send you to the group that is more suitable to what you need, whether that be not here, not anywhere, stop climate chaos, etc. So if you do have a particular, if you want to you know, get behind Megan, on what she's doing or Andy or and find out more about what Anna and Niall are working on. Um, and obviously Sorka is going to gently speak to the hanging fruit in all the different places. Um, and Angela, do you want to add anything as someone I've been conversing with a lot this week? Yeah, no, firstly, thank you very much. And thanks to all the panelists. That's been a very informative evening and um, lots of information for people to take on. And um, thank you to all of our participants. I think we were up to about 150 there at one stage. So that's great. Um, and just everyone keep up doing what you can do, like target whatever is easy for you and start there, small steps. Yeah. You're here for a reason and obviously you want more information or you want to help um, or get some answers. And everyone here has touched on something that I'm sure that everyone who's watching is interested in. So really do it again, don't And thank you for to Break Free for Plastic for supplying us with the movie. Yes, and thank you. the license for two nights. Thank you so much. Um, again, in the future, I imagine there will be with, in the, the future, the non-COVID <laughs> universe where we all get to stand in the same room in close quarters. Um, we'll hopefully that that's the, there'll be more screenings. Yes, our plan is to screen again in real time whenever yeah. we can. And good night. Take care. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>